We're here at Polk County Fire Rescue, where we're going to take a look at the science that goes into keeping us safe. So sit back, relax, and join us on this science quest. Hey, Mike. Good morning. I'm here with Mike, the Deputy Chief for Polk County Fire Rescue. Mike, we're in front of a fire truck. Tell me a little bit about it. Well, this particular truck right here is what we call a ladder truck. It's a 77-foot ladder on the top of this, what would normally be a fire engine. Uh, this truck has a pump that pumps at 1,250 gallons per minute. It has an onboard water tank that carries 500 gallons of water and then it has compartments all the way around it with various tools and equipment that the firefighter needs to do their job. Cool. Could uh, we take a look at some of those tools? Absolutely. Uh, let's start here. This is a particular uh, uh, bag that they call, it's called the RIT bag, and RIT stands for Rapid Intervention Team. If one of our firefighters gets in trouble, they're going to bring this with them. It has extra breathing air in it, some other tools and equipment. We always like to uh, take advantage of every empty space on the truck, so above our wheel wells is where we carry some of our spare cylinders. Now this cylinder is what goes on the breathing apparatus, so what we call an air pack that the firefighters use to allow them to breathe into it inside of a toxic atmosphere or an atmosphere that doesn't have enough oxygen to support human life. A common misconception is that there's oxygen inside of this, but that's not true. It's the same air you and I are breathing right now. We have a special compressor that just compresses it down and puts it into this bottle. And this particular uh, cylinder will hold about 45 minutes of breathing time. And can you uh, explain why, obviously, we don't want to use uh, oxygen? Yeah, and think about a fire situation. O oxygen makes any fire burn a whole lot better. Uh, and, and it would be, it'd also be very expensive to use pure oxygen. It's really no need. They just, in the normal, if you're working on the house or whatever, you're breathing normal air, it's the same thing. We just regular air is going to be fine. We just need to have it in a, in a manner in which we can breathe. Cool. Uh, on the science side of this, when I started 25 years ago, these were steel. They were very heavy. Now it's a composite material of aluminum and fiberglass. Some of them are even wrapped in carbon fiber to make them extremely light. And they've been able to, over the years, increase the pressure uh, that they, and the volume of air that they can, hear, uh, they, they can carry. And if you're familiar with Boyle's Law, as this cylinder is filled up and the pressure increases, so does the heat. So these things get very warm when we're filling them up. Conversely, if you open up the cylinder and let the air out very fast and the pressure drops very fast, they get very cold. So from a science standpoint, it's, it's kind of neat. Very cool. Remember I said this was a ladder truck? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, wow. There's going to be times when we can't use the big ladder up top. So we also have a set of what we call ground ladders. And these are the kind of ladders that you may have at your house for getting on the roof or whatever. Various sizes and shapes. Wouldn't be a fire truck without hose. So what we have here, this is called our supply hose. This is a large diameter hose, it's five inches in diameter, and this is the end that would connect to the fire hydrant. All right. And the hose would be laid out along the street and we would connect it onto the pump. And this allows the water to come out of the ground from the hydrant, come into the fire truck, and then be pressure added and squirted on the fire. And about how long is that? This is 1,000 feet, a right. uh, five inch hose. And, uh, it used to be smaller back in the day. There was two and a half inches in diameter, and they would lay one or two of those. And what we found with the new materials, going with plastics and thin synthetics, that we could make a larger fire hose. And it, uh, there's a lot less loss of friction, uh, loss of pressure due to friction loss. Uh, so we actually deliver more water 
through that municipal water system to the fire truck so we can put more water on the fire faster. It's a huge leap in, um, in technology for us when we did that. It's been a great thing for us. And I, I see it's all folded up. Is it, uh, I mean, real heavy to put up in there? Yeah, it's a pain in the neck. <laughs> yeah. So after the fire, we turn the fire hydrant off, we disconnect it, but we have to make sure we get all of the water out of the hose before we load it back up because water's very heavy. It's 8.35 pounds per gallon. Okay. So you can imagine a thousand feet of five inch hose, that's a, a, quite a bit of water in there. So we'll get that out. And then the firefighters, through a coordinated effort, will actually, instead of dragging the hose and putting it on, we'll will actually slowly back the fire truck up while they load the hose onto the truck. Okay. A couple of different things in this compartment. Um, First of all, we, we, we have some various fire extinguishers, different kinds of fire extinguishers. There's small fires that we don't need to pull fire hoses off and squirt water. We may be able to extinguish them with a fire. And if you remember your basic science, there's different forms of fire extinguishers. This one uses carbon dioxide, okay. which is a gas, a compressed gas, and it basically smothers the fire. It occludes the oxygen, so the fire goes out that way. You remember the old basic fire triangle? Yeah. Got to have three things to have a fire. Got to have heat, fuel, and oxygen and this one removes that oxygen. Does a little bit of cooling, but not much. The other one is a, a water extinguisher, uh, commonly called the can, and the person that carries it we call the can man. Uh, but they'll bring that in, and it's just like you would imagine. It's, of course, a small stream of water. The other one that's tucked around the back here that you can't see that well is an ABC dry chemical. And it usually uses something like monomonium phosphate uh, to uh, inhibit the chemical chain reaction of the fire and, and put it out that way. And why would we uh, want to make sure that we use, I guess, you know, different fire extinguishers? Excellent question. Um, the CO2 extinguisher works very good with flammable liquids. It's also good if I have uh, uh, like a computer or electronic equipment or energized electrical, I can use this and there's no residue. Okay. Uh, the water extinguisher works great for class A fuels like wood and paper and those things like that. Uh, and the dry chemical also works well on a class B, which is an oil or grease fire on a stove or such as that, but it does leave a residue. However, uh, it lasts longer. I have a little bit different, I can uh, squirt it farther than I can the CO2. If I got a little bit of wind like today, it's a little easier to maneuver than the CO2. As, that, as it comes out as a gas, it blows all over the place. So, it all, you know, the firefighters are making these split second decisions when they recognize what kind of fire it is and they'll come back and get the correct extinguisher for the job. Cool. I showed you the, uh, what we call an SCBA cylinder on the other side that's short for uh, self-contained breathing apparatus. That's the whole thing put together here. This is what we call an air pack also. They wear it on the back of the firefighter and it gives us that breathing air so we can go into a toxic atmosphere or an atmosphere that doesn't have enough oxygen and perform their job. Typically you'll see them wearing this when they're inside of a house fighting a fire or a building or something such as that. And on average how long uh, does the tank last? It depends on the exertion level and actually the fitness level of the firefighter. Typically between 30, 25, 30 minutes on average. Uh, depending on the work that they're doing, sometimes they can last a lot longer, 40 minutes or more. Okay. Um, but it, it's, it's you know probably another 40 pounds of weight that they're carrying on their back. Uh, so it, it does have a... Um, does take its toll. So yeah. typically our, our standard operating procedure is uh, you'll go in, you'll fight the fire. When your air gets low and your alarm starts going off, like on your car, when you get low and you get low fuel, it has an alarm. Mm -hmm. When they get low on air, it has an alarm. They'll come out, they'll switch out to another cylinder, they'll go back in. After their second cylinder, then we force them to take a break. Okay. Some other tools and equipment in this. Uh, this particular tool is called a Halligan bar. Uh, it's used for many, many different things, mainly for forcing entry into locked doors. You can see there's a couple of different uh, portions of the tool. We have a, a thin wedge here that we can wedge in between the door and the jam and force it open that way. We have a pick 
Um, and then we also have a larger end called an ADS uh, for various uses. And this is a part that we can strike on. If you noticed in here, we had a uh, sledgehammer. Uh, we'll use a sledgehammer to drive this into the door and force it open. Very cool. Uh, very, very low tech, but very, very effective. The firefighter that is assigned to drive the truck and operate the pump is called the driver engineer, and this is called the engineer's compartment. This is where we have a lot of our various appliances and nozzles and, and, and tools that allow us to connect our hoses and apply our water. Part of the fire truck is its pump. And this is, a, remember I mentioned it's a 1,250 gallon per minute pump. Uh, this is where it is controlled. This is where the water from the fire hydrant would go in. We call this the intake. And anything from this area up is a discharge. So this is where the water would come out. But, and uh, there's a lot of other uh, areas around the truck where the water can come out. Uh, the back of the truck, the other side, and even the front. And then we also have a couple of extra hoses up here that are already pre-connected. All they do is grab the nozzle and go to the building on fire and they don't have to roll them out and connect them together. Everything's built for speed. But the driver operator will monitor the pressure of the water coming in and set the pressures going out. And there's a whole class on hydraulics that they have to, to go through to be able to do that as well. So a lot of work gets done here. Okay, the cab of the truck is where the firefighters ride, and there's a couple of pre-stage tools. One of the newest ones to the fire service, very high-tech for us, is this tool here. And this is called a thermal imaging camera. It's a military technology that's been adapted for the fire service. And what this does is it peers through the smoke I can use the camera to see through the heat and see the different heat signatures, many different uses for that. The most important is to find the people that are trapped in the fire. But sometimes when we're in a fire and you can't see your hand in front of your face, you're not exactly sure where the fire is at. So we can use this to find it. On smaller fires, like you smell smoke in your house and we can't quite determine where it's at, we can use this to see if you've got an electrical outlet going bad or maybe a light ballast that's going bad or whatever. So we can do that instead of tearing down your wall searching for this hidden fire, we can use this to pinpoint and minimize the damage. We can actually look at electrical lines that are knocked over on a vehicle accident and tell if they're energized or not using this because if they're energized, there's, uh, they're hot. They're, there's actually little bit of heat to them so this will differentiate between the heat and what we know looking at them if they're energized or not. Very cool. Yeah it's pretty neat. And then lastly here in the front of the truck you, you can see the, the tip of the ladder. Uh, we use the ladder obviously for accessing the, the higher elevations, but we also have a nozzle up here that we can flow water, and it'll flow a thousand gallons per minute. It's really no different than the nozzle that the firefighters hold, it's only much larger. And of course it has to be mounted because of that reaction, that nozzle reaction when they're flowing water is quite great. So it's mounted and it's all controlled electronically. They can, they can operate it from the tip of the ladder or from the base of the uh, ladder back there at the, at the turntable. Well, Mike, this is a very, very cool piece of equipment. Appreciate that. Um, it's, it, we have a lot of different fire trucks, so they're going to look a little different around the county, but they're all similarly set up. They, uh, it looks like you take pretty good care of them. Yeah, you're right. The taxpayers do invest a lot of money in our equipment, so we do our best to take care of it. Oh, sounds like they're getting a call. You want to go with them? Uh, sure. Come on. Thank you.
we're on scene. We've got a two-story concrete block structure with heavy fire showing on the helmet side. On the side. Well, how was the ride? That was pretty intense. I mean, we were really booking it. Yeah. Uh, did everybody move out of the way normally, or? Well, it's been a problem. You would think a big truck like this, loud sirens, lights, horns, that people would just naturally get out of the way, and sometimes they don't. They'll have their windows up, air conditioning on, loud music, many, many different reasons that they just don't get over. But the law is you need to get out of the way. Move, pull over to the right or, or wherever you can so that the fire trucks and ambulances can safely pass. It, yeah. it is an issue and we're working on it. Well, I, I, I hope that, that issue is fixed. Yeah. <laughs> Lives depend on it. Exactly. Let me show you what the guys have to wear when they're fighting fire. The guys and girls, by the way, because we do have a lot of female firefighters. You'll notice they're both very similarly dressed. Let me just point out a couple of quick differences. The firefighter is wearing a black helmet and the lieutenant wears a red helmet. And that's just so everyone on scene understands who's doing what because they have different roles. They're both wearing protective equipment from head to toe. Uh, at this point, if it was a real fire, they would be continuing to suit up and covering every piece of skin up uh, to make an attack on the fire. But right now, because we're not fighting fire, they're, uh, they're in a situation where uh, uh, they would be getting ready. At the very bottom, we'll talk about the boots. They have special boots. They're steel toe, like you see a lot of construction boots and work boots are that way. But also the sole on the very bottom has a steel plated in, in it as well to keep nails and other sharp instruments from poking through on the bottom. And they're also fire resistant. The pants and the coat are uh, a layered ensemble and the outside is a fire retardant shell. It's very thin, but it, it, it uh, keeps from burning. And then there's a thick layer of an insulating uh, material to keep that heat from transferring into their body. And in between the two of those is what they call a vapor barrier. And that vapor barrier is to keep hazardous chemicals and gases from seeping through and attacking their skin. Uh, we talked about the breathing apparatus that they wear on their back. It's connected to their face with this face mask. They wear firefighting gloves as well that are, that are more than just work gloves. There again, they, they've got a vapor barrier in them and they're also protecting them against the extreme heat. The lieutenant uh, is wearing, and, and the firefighter both have portable radios uh, so they can communicate with each other and with the outside. And then we pointed out the fire helmets as well. They give uh, like a hard hat. They give protection from falling. They also protect from the heat and they both have flip down visors. Now when they're wearing their mask, they've got eye protection on as well. But if they're working in a situation where they're not wearing a mask, the visor gives them a form of eye protection as well. So uh, as you can imagine, it's very heavy and it's very hot, very hot. Uh, but that's what they need to be able to, to go in the side of those fires, which can range, the four temperatures can be two, or two to 300 degrees, and it can be 12, 1500 degrees at the ceiling, so it can get very, very hot. Uh, so to operate in that environment, they, they need all this level of protection. Okay, what he's doing is taking off the cap of one of the hydrant, and he's gonna crack it open, make sure it's still a good hydrant, which it usually is. And you'll see that the water that starts to come out is probably has a little bit of rust and dirt. That's normal, then it clears right up. He'll shut it down, put the cap back on, and then he'll open up the big uh, opening, which is called the steamer. Meanwhile, the crews in the back are getting their, their short fire hose there. He's going to connect his um, short section of hose between the hydrant and the um, intake of the truck. Now there's an adapter he's going to need to get off the back of the truck. You'll notice on this big hose, there's no threads. Uh, they use what's called a stores connection, and it's a simple quarter turn, locks in place, and we're good to go. Everything that we do is typically built for speed. You notice there was no laces on the boots. But they, ever, they slide in, they got suspenders, there's no belts that we're dealing with, there's snaps instead of buttons. Some of them have zippers. Uh, the only thing is on some of these hydrants, most of the hydrants are threaded still, but uh, some hydrants in some communities are starting to just have that connection on there, so all they do is the quarter turn and we're good to go. As he laid it out in kind of a loop, because what we don't want is a kink. 
top. Uh, because when you're talking about this much water, uh, if you get a significant kink, then you'll, uh, you'll not be able to flow the maximum amount of water. Now for this testing purposes, he kind of did it quick and we got a couple of kinks, but it's not that big a deal. The reason we have water coming out is we leave that open uh -huh. because you know water's not compressible, but air is. Yeah. If we left it closed and there was air in there, as that water flows through the hose, it could build up enough air pressure to burst our hose. So we have that bleeder. So as the air goes through, it bleeds off that excess air pressure, and as soon as water comes out, then we know we've got all the air out, we close it down. And he's kind of servicing that hose, getting most of the major kinks out. Typically, you see how, this, how long it's taking them to hook this up? Yeah. That's why we use pre-connected hose, those ones above his head there. They're already connected. They just roll them out, and they're ready to start flowing water. Okay, so you see that this is a one firefighter operation. It's, he's not kneeling down because he's lazy. There's, as you can see, there's a lot of nozzle reaction. Of all that force going out is equal reaction in the opposite direction. So by essing and snaking that hose down onto the ground like that, it's pushing down on the ground so it, so it absorbs a lot of that nozzle reaction. The particular nozzle that he's using is what we call a smooth bore nozzle, very low tech. It's just an open hole, and you see it goes from a larger diameter to a smaller one. Yeah. And it gives us very good reach. That fire hose is sending the majority of its water downstream. So we can put a lot of water to the seat of the fire on the actual stuff that's burning to cool it down to the point that it doesn't emit the gases that burn very effective that way. On large fires, uh, we really want to use this kind of a nozzle. It's, it, like I said, it's low tech. There's only one moving part, and that's the bale. So it's maintenance free for the most part, very reliable on our fire scenes. It works fantastic. Now what we're going to do here is switch over to the other nozzle. Okay. Mike, if you shut down, we'll uh, switch over. The other nozzle that he's putting on is called a fog nozzle. And what it's used for is to take the water and break it down into smaller droplets. And with this breeze, we might get a little overspray on us. Now, what would you use uh, the smaller droplets for? Uh, in a confined fire where we're looking for the steam conversion, where we want that water to turn to steam, it'll expand. At 212 degrees, water will expand 1,700 times its volume. So there's a lot of times we'll go in, we'll stick it in the window, we'll do a fog like that, it'll expand the uh, to, uh, steam and smother and extinguish that fire in that room. We do not do it if anybody's inside because it's very bad on them. But uh, confined fires are like um, if we had a rail car, a box car, and it was on fire, we could cut a hole in the roof, do this, and it'll steam the whole thing. Uh, so it's a very safe method. So in this situation, he's got it on a fog pattern. Now we cut the pressure down so we can talk and everything. But you see how much wider it is? Those yeah. are small droplets of water. What it really does for the firefighters is it makes a protective wall. It, it separates them from the fire. So if we, some of the fires, they have to advance up on like a uh, LP gas tank that's on fire. They have to go up and shut the valve off. This allows them to approach that very, very hot fire and this wall of water gives them protection from the heat, from that radiant heat that's coming off. And if you remember, there's a couple of different ways that heat transfer. There's conduction, mm -hmm. there's convection, and there's radiation. Well, in this matter, we're protecting from that radiant heat. And it's kind of the way we feel that sun beating down on us today, that's radiant heat. This fire will put that out the same, off the same way as well. So the fog pattern gives the firefighters protection to advance up and, and either make a rescue or shut a valve off or, or do some other things as well. Awesome. All right, so I see that you have different size hoses. I've noticed it in the truck. How do you choose what hose you're using? Very, very good question. Uh, there, there's basically two roles. There's a tack hose and there's supply hose. The big yellow hose you see right here is what we call our supply hose, and it is to supply the water from the municipal water system to the pump of the okay. fire truck. And it, it, nowadays, we typically use this five inch diameter hose. Uh, coming off of the municipal water system, and there may be one or more fire trucks between the fire hydrant 
and the uh, and the fire truck that's actually at the scene. The, the farther we are away, the more of a loss there is in pressure. That's called friction loss. And the best way to demonstrate this at home is if you've got a garden hose and you hook up one garden hose, you have a certain amount of pressure at the end. Yeah. But if you've ever hooked more than one together, like if you really wanted to make it stretch a long ways, as you add more garden hoses, the pressure gets less and less at the end to the point that it's just dribbling out. That's because the friction of the water flowing through there, it uh, eats the pressure. Basically, it reduces the pressure as you go out. So we have to augment that by adding pump, uh, pressure at the pump. So the water flows into this pump, and this is a centrifugal pump. It uses centrifugal force to add the pressure to the uh, water, and then it flows out the discharge. And in this case, these are our attack lines. And back to your question, which line do we use? Um, if I need a line that's very maneuverable, I have to go in and out of a bunch of tight places very quickly, I'm going to use this smaller attack line. And this particular one is inch and three quarters in size. Typically can be handled by one firefighter. We prefer two where possible. Okay. Uh, but it's like a gun. This is going to be our smaller caliber gun. It doesn't flow that much water. It doesn't extinguish that much fire. So I have a larger fire. I may need multiples of these, two, three, four, to get the same amount of water on the fire to put it out. As we go up from there, we have larger diameter hose. And you can see this right here. This is a two and a half inch hose. It's, this would be the bigger caliber gun. It's going to flow a larger. For example, this is probably going to flow around 150, 160 gallons per minute. The two and a half will flow 250, 275 gallons a minute. That's a big amount of water, so that's going to take two or more firefighters if you're going to be advancing it, if you're going to be moving it through the, fire, uh, the yeah. building on fire or whatever. So we use that for our larger fires. This two-story house, if it was fully engulfed in fire, we'd probably be using that size hose or larger. Warehouses, uh, restaurants, bigger buildings like that, we're going to be using those larger ones. Smaller, what we call a room in contents, maybe a bedroom on fire, a kitchen on fire, where we want to get in there quick, put that one room out, we're going to use the smaller hose like this. Now, this is obviously the perfect setup. The fire hydrant right next to the fire truck, yeah. minimum amount of distance to go, so we're going to get the maximum amount of water out of the fire hydrant. But let's say, for example, that the fire was way down there, more than 1,000 feet. Well, I've only got 1,000 feet on the truck. What do we do? In that case, we'll use hose from two or more fire trucks to make that lay. And then one fire truck will stay here at the fire hydrant. The water will come out of the hydrant like this. They'll boost the pressure. And instead, they won't be spraying any water on the fire. They're not anywhere close. They'll, their job is to push that water down the street through the fire hose, the supply hose, to the other truck at the fire. And then that truck will then apply the water to the fire. Okay. And that's called relay pumping. Now, the other scenario is there's no fire hydrant. What do we do then? A couple of different options. If we're close to a lake or what we call a static water system, maybe a pond, maybe a pool or whatever, we have specialized hose on some of the trucks that hooks directly into here and goes into the water. And the procedure's called drafting. And the science behind that is, you know, there's atmospheric pressure right now, 14.7 at sea level. We create a lower pressure in the pump. And that 14.7 pounds pushes down on the water and it draws it up into the pump. We then add pressure to it and send it down to the fire or down the street to the other truck. We call that a drafting operation. And a uh, maximum theoretical lift is 33 feet. On a good day, we can get about 15 to 20 feet because you're always going to have a little bit of an air leak somewhere. So, uh, so we carry 20 feet of that hose, uh, and we test each, our trucks every year on the ability to do that. So uh, it's, it's like using a straw in the exactly in the water. same thing. When you're using that straw, you make that low pressure in your mouth, and and people think they're sucking the water up, but technically they're not. They make a low pressure area, atmospheric pressure pushes the milkshake or whatever into their mouth. So.
Very cool. Mike, this has been really, really cool. I, I didn't realize that there's just so much more that goes into this. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot more that we didn't even have time for today, am I correct? That's correct. This is just the tip of the iceberg. You know, the joke amongst the firefighters is we put the wet stuff on the red stuff, but <laughs> there, as you can see, there's a whole lot more than that. The training starts in the academy and it really continues throughout your career. I've been here almost 30 years. I'm still going to school to keep up with the changing technology and, and refreshing and all that. So it is quite a, uh, quite a career that, you know, to know a little bit about everything. Well, thank you very much for taking me out here. Let me ride in the fire truck. It has been a blast, and I, I really appreciate it. No problem. Anytime. Well, that's all we have for today. Join us next time as we seek out yet another science quest.